Welcome to the Pelvic Health Summit. I'm your host, Hannah Matluck, and this is your co-host, Dr. Allison Shrikande of Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine. Today, we are here with Dr. Peter Gregerson, the Director of Research Genetics at the Feinstein Institute at Northwell Health. And we are also here with Dr. Christine Metz. She is a professor at the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research at Northwell Health and a professor at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra and Northwell in the departments of OBGYN and Molecular Medicine. Thank you so much for being here today. Of course, thank you. Pleasure to be here. So can you first tell us how you got started in work with endometriosis? Sure, I'll start. Um, my journey with endometriosis research started almost 20 years ago um, through interacting with a wonderful Canadian professor, Dr. Ali Akum who contacted me in his research, related to his research on endometriosis, and he was interested in macrophage migration inhibitory factor. And I had been working on that molecule for about 10 years, and we explored its role in endometriosis, in the progression of the disease, and its role in inflammation and angiogenesis. And unfortunately, he passed away, but he did begin collaborating with uh, Peter and myself at the Feinstein um, when we started getting interested in collaborating on endometriosis. And uh, I got interested in endometriosis for a very personal reason. I actually spent all, most of my career working on the genetics of autoimmunity. I'm a rheumatologist as well as a geneticist. But about five years ago, uh, I had a friend who's a nurse who was suffering from endometriosis, and I realized I knew nothing about this disease. Um, and so I got interested. She's a woman that has you know, had five surgeries, and I met with her uh, laparoscopic surgeon to see what these lesions looked like, and basically realized that there was a big genetic component to this. I'm a geneticist, so that was interesting. And that there was very little understanding of how the disease actually works. So uh, I then realized that Christine knew something about this disease, so we got together and really started planning an approach to the research. Can you tell us a little bit about the genetics of endometriosis? Yeah, so the genetics of endometriosis is complex. Uh, it's not that dissimilar from other dis complex diseases like diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis and things that I've been working on for many years. There are, for many of those diseases, there are tens or hundreds of genes. Right now, there are about 27 genetic regions that have been defined as providing risk for uh, endometriosis. But like these other disorders, each of those genetic associations are very weak. Uh, by themselves, they are not predictive, and even together, they're probably not very predictive. They simply give you insight into what might be going wrong. And so in autoimmunity, obviously, a lot of the genes are involved in the immune system. Very few, although some of the genes in endometriosis are involved with immunity, but many of them are involved in the differentiation of cells that are found in the uterine lining. And so that gives us a clue that there's something going on, even in the uterine lining, that is predisposing uh, to endometriosis. The other, th I will tell you that to get to those genes has required a massive effort. So the last uh, uh, experiments that were done to map genes for endometriosis involved 50,000 people with endometriosis taken from many different places with hundreds of thousands of controls just to identify these 27 regions. I think what is unstudied is familial endometriosis. We know that endometriosis runs in families, and that is vastly understudied. And probably there are genes that are rather uncommon in the population that could explain endometriosis in those families. And those genes are really important to identify, in my view, because if you can identify them, you may be able to come up with a target for therapy. And there's a great example for that out in the literature. There is a gene that is involved with controlling cholesterol levels that was discovered about 12 years ago. 
and rare in families, and there are now three drugs based on that discovery to lower cholesterol. So I think the idea of discovering uncommon genes in families that are loaded with endometriosis is very, very important and has not been done. And we would like to do, that's one of the things we would like to do. Can you tell us a little bit about the ROSE trial, what it stands for, what it means? Sure, I'm you're doing. That. ROSE stands for Research Outsmarts Endometriosis, <laughs> R-O-S-E. And in fact, we have a little ROSE pin <laughs> um, that we wear to advertise the study and promote the study. The study is focused on developing a novel diagnostic for endometriosis and for better understanding this disease. And our approach is to study menstrual blood or menstrual effluent. So a lot of people say, well, why on earth would you start studying that? Um, well, there's a long-standing scientific basis for this approach. And it's been very well known and described that the endometrium or the lining of the uterus in women with endometriosis is very different from women without endometriosis. It's different in several different aspects. It has more inflammation, there's more local estrogen, there's more prostaglandins, lesions that are outside of the uterus actually communicate with the cells in the uterus. And many women with endometriosis have uh, infertility, which is believed to again be linked to the uterine lining and implantation defects. Our work has actually shown that specific cells in menstrual blood, which come from the endometrial lining, are very different in women with endometriosis compared to women without endometriosis. And we're using those cells that we can easily isolate from menstrual blood to develop either a screening tool for endometriosis or a diagnostic and to learn more about the progression of this disease so that we could develop more effective treatments. What have you noticed in working with patients with endometriosis? So I think, you know, the range of patients who come to us who have endometriosis start with young, and we even have grandmothers that come. And I would say the two peak populations are women who are experiencing uh, severe pain and anxiety related to their either potential diagnosis of endometriosis or their actual diagnosis of endometriosis. And then we have another population of women who have experienced infertility. And as part of that workup, they have learned they have endo. And they have joined the study to really participate and help us learn more about it. The grandmothers join because they're interested in participating in the genetic component so that their children or grandchildren don't necessarily have to suffer with this disease. Um, and we've learned a lot about this disease that can't be taught in textbooks. Uh, and one of the things that we've learned recently is that it has a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms that are not well described in the literature. So most people think of pain pain during menses or before menses, pain during urination, or um, pain during sex. But a lot of people don't realize that one of the major symptoms that women with endometriosis suffer with are GI symptoms. Um, and we've learned about this, and um, we're now thinking about how to do research in that area to help these women. Very interesting, because in my practice, I, I see the same thing. Mm. I'd say it's uh, very common for patients who are eventually are diagnosed with endometriosis to have started in the gastroenterology area first and then be sent to us later. So I see the same thing clinically. That's very yeah. interesting. And I, and I think that adds to the long delay in diagnosis for women with endometriosis, which is published to be anywhere between seven and 10 years. And we've heard even worse numbers than that from some of our subjects that participate. And I think what happens is many women end up being bumped from one doctor to another before they really realize what is wrong with them. Completely agree. Would you like to expand on some of the uh, GI aspects for the yeah, research? Yeah, we're, we're actually very intrigued with the idea that the chronic inflammation that leads to differences in the endometrial lining may be due to a lot of different factors. I mean, it may be due to the endometriosis lesions themselves. Mm -hmm. 
but we think that inflammatory bowel disease might in fact predispose <laughs> to the development of these differences and therefore predispose to endometriosis. There are some studies out there suggesting that the two diseases occur more commonly together than you would expect, but there, it's not well studied and did the endometriosis come first? Did the inflammatory bowel disease come first? So there's a lot that needs to be done. We are actually um, planning on studying patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease to see if their endometrial lining cells that we can get out of the menstrual blood are in fact different wow. uh, when you have inflammatory bowel disease. Amazing. A question that I have about the ROSE study is I believe you collect the participants a sample of their menstrual blood and then what, what do you do with that? So we actually, um, it starts kind of with a, it's, it's a process first. Um, the potential research subjects call the research coordinators at our office and they explain the study. And then they actually send them a kit to their homes. And it contains either a menstrual cup or a sponge pad for the collection. And women then can collect during the heaviest days of their flow in the privacy of their own home. And then they send the sample in a little container that's sealed with some antibiotics to our research lab. When it arrives there, we begin the collection of the sample and isolate the stromal fibroblast cells that are present in the menstrual blood. And it's a, a two-week process for us to actually process the cells and begin the different types of studies that we're interested in. One of them is a decidualization study in which we study the differentiation of these cells, which is found to be defective in patients with endometriosis. And the other is to look at either protein markers or gene expression patterns that are different in patients with endo. And together, these um, parameters give us the tools to differentiate between women with endometriosis and controls. And so for everyone listening who is a patient who m might be interested in being a part of the study, I'm sure that they're wondering, do they get any of these results or is it kept in more of the medical side, the medical records for your research yeah. and future so, research? So we, we get this question frequently because right. people want to know what their cells look like. Um, we're, we're doing this in the context of research. Our first goal is to develop this into an FDA approved test. But until we do that, we are not able to return results and have people act on them, a physician act on them, uh, based on you know, what is still research. We need to prove that these cells uh, and their abnormalities, which by the way, are multiple as, as Christine indicated, and are not subtle. I mean, they are easy to see. <laughs> And it's sort of amazing that, you know, basically no one has looked at stromal cells from, uh, from menstrual blood anywhere. Uh, and there are very, very few labs that have looked at menstrual blood at all in any context. So we can't return results because we can't prove what, that they are predictive or useful for diagnosis, but we want to get there as fast as possible by going to the FDA and set showing a proof that they predict endometriosis. And the way you predict endometriosis is to do this test and then have someone have a laparoscopy that actually proves it. That's what's going to make the FDA say, yes, this, this test should be out there. So we are really looking for women who have endometriosis, who are considering having a laparoscopy. If they can give us a sample, that will allow us, if we have some, some several hundreds of women, who give us that sample and we show 100% it's predictive of uh, endometriosis as seen by laparoscopy, that will convince the FDA to allow us to have a clinically approved test. Is there anything else that can cause these abnormal cells? So there are a, there are a number of diseases that um, uh, have been described as having these kinds of abnormalities. One of them is an identity called, it's a poorly defined entity called chronic endometritis, which is often asymptomatic <laughs> and uh, is made by, a di by biopsying the uterine lining and there's certain inflammatory cells there that contribute to a diagnosis. People who have that diagnosis have an increased risk of endometriosis. Um, their uh, polycystic ovary syndrome also has these abnormalities and may also predispose to this. So 
There are probably other entities, and that's part of what the FDA wants to see. They want to see if you have a woman with the right symptoms that suggest endometriosis, that this can tell you it's endometriosis. It's very different from doing the test in a woman who has absolutely no symptoms at all, right? Then the abnormalities could be due to those other things. So you, with every clinical test, the test needs to be applied in a setting that is appropriate to that test, and that's what we need to do. Right, I can, I can follow up on that, that there is a big difference between research and clinical medicine. Clinical medicine today is based on research 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. The research that we're doing today will determine what medicine is in 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. And people who go to see their clinicians and healthcare providers for their symptoms are treated with treatments that have been approved and validated and very well understood. And when you participate in research, it's voluntary. That's number one. You don't have to participate. It's totally voluntary. Um, but you don't um, quite get to know all of the results depending on the study. Now, there's two types of research. There's interventional research and observational research. Interventional research, you receive an intervention, a treatment that is being tested, such as a chemotherapeutic agent for cancer. Um, and there are risks that are involved. And an observational study, such as the Framingham Heart Study, where you observe populations, is what our study is. We're observing populations and observing their menstrual blood. So there's different types of studies um, for people to participate in. And it's really important for diverse populations to participate in these studies because it will help us develop the best test. And we believe that menstrual blood will not only tell us about endometriosis, it may also give us some clues about uterine health and infertility. Uh, it may even give us some clues about the early stages of uh, uterine cancer. So we think that it's a wide open area for research right now. Can you describe the ideal candidates of patients who want to help and who would like to participate other than, as you had mentioned earlier, planning for a laparoscopy? Um, anyone else could participate or if they've had one already? Well, I think anybody with endometriosis uh, or, or who has symptoms of endometriosis, uh, we, would, we would love to study them. And of course, we also have to study controls. So we actually have a lot of women who don't have any problem at all who give us samples. And so we use that to compare. Um, I would say, as I referred to in my earlier discussion of the genetics, if there are large families out there who have endometriosis, they are incredibly valuable. So if, if there are people out there with large families with multiple people with endometriosis, we would love to study you. Right. Right. <laughs> and also, not everybody has to provide a menstrual yeah. sample. So to participate in the genetic aspect of the study, you would need to provide a peripheral blood sample or a buccal sample. Um, and obviously, most of our, all of our participants to date are 18 years and older. And we're really hoping to expand into the teenage mm. population and the middle school population to really better understand men menstrual health in young teens. And we will be revising our protocol this summer to include and expand it to teens. So we're hoping for 12 and above. And so that we can really start understanding this disease much earlier than it has been studied in the past. Yeah, there's clear data in the literature that adults with endometriosis often have an adolescent history that suggests uh, severe dysmenorrhea that requires medication that is associated with missing school. Those kinds of experiences in adolescence are actually predictive of, of future endometriosis. I mean, they may have the endometriosis at the time, but it, of course it doesn't get diagnosed until somebody thinks of it and get, there's a laparoscopic uh, investigation. So we want to actually study large numbers of adolescent girls. Just tell us what your symptoms are, uh, and you may have none. Give us uh, a sample on this pad, which is really easy to use. There's no insertion of anything. And seeing if we can correlate the severity of, ex of symptoms of dysmenorrhea and you know, abdominal bloating or whatever it is in adolescent girls with the findings 
in the menstrual blood. Mm -hmm. So that would be another confirmation that what we're seeing in these cells is actually reflective of a uterine abnormality. How do you see the future of endometriosis, both mm. diagnostic, <laughs> treatment, mm. care? So I think, you know, right now the biggest obstacles are the delay in, diagnos the delay in diagnosis, um, either ineffective treatments or treatments that are not easily tolerated by patients, invasive diagnostics, which are a, a problem for many people, and invasive treatments. Uh, sometimes treatment requires surgery. And I would hope that the future for women with endometriosis is that it is diagnosed much earlier so that they don't have the health problems that are caused by the progression of the disease. If it could be halted earlier, you wouldn't have the severe uh, abdominal problems that women have, and you wouldn't have the infertility that women have and suffer with now. Um, a cure would be amazing, and of course, prevention is the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. um, if we could actually learn how to prevent this disease, would be just totally amazing. Yeah, and I don't think that's an unrealistic expectation because you know, there are a lot of new drugs that address inflammation. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very expensive, but then now there are new drugs developing that can inhibit the release of inflammatory products. Uh, one could easily imagine finding, for example, an adolescent girl who has a lot of symptoms, who has abnormalities of these cells, and that you could show that that's a reflection of chronic inflammation in the uterine lining and develop a treatment for that chronic inflammation that's relatively benign, certainly more benign than putting that person on Lupron or whatever else or, or doing surgery. So I think those, those things are not unrealistic to imagine. Uh, but you have to have a diagnostic that doesn't involve looking inside somebody's belly, right? right. <laughs> right? And so that's what we're after. Wow. Amazing work, really. Thank you so much for doing this research and studying this disease that so many women suffer in silence from for years, decades. If anyone listening wants to be a part of the study, which I hope that many people do, can you explain how they can go about being a part of it? Sure, absolutely. Uh, there will be a picture showing the, uh, <laughs> the flyer that recruits patients, uh, so you'll show that. Um, and they can call our study nurse, um, Margaret DeFranco, who's really terrific and walks through study participation and answers questions. So no participant should uh, think about participating if they have hesitation. They should really try to understand what the participation means and they can do that by talking with our coordinators. And they answer a questionnaire and sign a consent. Uh, and then they're asked to provide a menstrual blood sample or samples, because uh, sometimes we're interested in trying to understand whether collections in one month reflect the collection, you know, the same observations in the next month. Um, and then we're also asking them for a peripheral blood sample in some cases. Um, and that's the, the real participation. And it's really been amazing working with our research subjects who have even done fundraising for us. Yeah. Some of these research subjects have been absolutely amazing. Even our control subjects who are incredibly supportive of these women because they have friends, they have family members who are really suffering with this disease and really want to help. So let me just say that um, for anybody that calls up and speaks to Margaret, you will enjoy the experience. She is very engaging, very knowledgeable, and very caring, and she can explain all these details to you. We can actually have people anywhere in the country enroll in this study. We've, we've done the experiments. We've shown that uh, shipping the menstrual sponge by FedEx overnight is just fine. We can get the same data out of that sample. So just to clarify, you can only be a part of the study if you live in the United States. Or, or Canada. North, yeah, or, or Canada. Canada. Got it. OK, thank you again for doing this amazing research and studying all of these women. This is truly where the future of medicine is going. So it's incredible that you guys have dedicated your work to this. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. We enjoyed it.
Thank you for tuning in. If you can relate to this video, please leave a comment below and share this with anyone else who you think may benefit. Thank you. Thank you.